Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and I'd like to welcome you this morning to a discussion of the Three Seas Initiative in Central Europe. Uh, this morning's event is going to feature the Chargé d'Affaires at the Embassy of Estonia, uh, Marco Koplima, and the director of the Eastern Europe Studies Center, Linus Koyala. Um, they'll be discussing this initiative and what the implications are for Europe as well as for U.S. foreign policy. Our moderator this morning is FPRI's very own Chris Miller, who is the program uh, director of our Eurasia program. He's also an assistant professor of international history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, his most recent book is Putinomics, The Power and Money in Resurgent Russia. He's also the author of The Struggle to Save the Soviet Economy, Mikhail Gorbachev and the Collapse of the USSR, which was published in 2016. And I'll put a plug in for his books, one of which is uh, just about to be published. And it's Russia's Pivots to Asia from Peter the Great to Putin. And he's also working on another book called Chip Wars a, um, a uh, comparative history and analysis of Russia and Chinese semiconductors industries, which I know is of great interest to many of you. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to say thank you to our members, our donors, our sponsors. Uh, without this, we could not bring you these events. If you're not yet a member, please consider becoming one. We need you. And uh, as I'm fond of saying, these events are free to all of you, but they're not free to us. So do consider uh, being generous uh, with FPRI. Um, a couple of other notes. Uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, roughly halfway through, we'll be going to your questions and we welcome them. We'll also be posting in the chat uh, box uh, we'll be posting um, maps for those of you who want to familiarize yourself with the region. And um, we're also recording this, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards or share it with your friends and colleagues, and we encourage you to do that. Uh, so without further ado, I shall turn it over to Chris Miller. Well, thank you, Raleigh, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited to uh, welcome both Marco and Linas to join us, uh, two um, uh, experts in the region, uh, Marco representing the government of Estonia uh, in Washington for the past uh, several years, uh, Linus, one of Lithuania's uh, leading experts on uh, European politics uh, and, and much beyond. So there's, I think, no two better people uh, to combine their uh, insights and help us understand uh, the impact of the Three Seas Initiative today in Europe uh, for the United States and, and for the world. I think the Three, Se Three Seas Initiative is a great topic for us today for several reasons. One, as I think our discussion will underscore, it's quite important in understanding some of the key political and economic trends uh, underway in Europe right now. It's an initiative that has economic and geopolitical importance. But two, I think especially for listeners outside of Central Europe, the Three Seas Initiative is underestimated in its importance. And one of our, I think, goals today is to understand why it matters, not just for the region itself, but more broadly. And I think it'll be very clear as our discussion uh, begins that in fact, it is an initiative with, with importance that extends far beyond the region. And so I'd like to dig into those broader impacts uh, today to think about the effect on European security, on Europe's economy, and, and also on global trends that involve uh, not only Europe, but also the United States and, uh, and other regions of the world. But before we dive into the impacts of the Three Seas Initiative, I'd love to uh, first understand a bit better on what the Three Seas Initiative actually is. It's something that has uh, been quite important in Central Europe, but is underestimated, as I mentioned, in many other parts of the world. And so perhaps, Marco, could I turn to you first for uh, an explanation of the origins of the Three Seas Initiative and, and what it's actually doing today? Uh, of course. Uh, thank you, Chris. And it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you. Um, I thank the PRI for giving me this opportunity. And as Chris mentioned, this is the Three Seas is one of the most important topics that the Estonian government has been working for the past few years. It is uh, the central focus point, at least the last year when we hosted the summit, and we see great potential in it. We see that is it is tremendously important for the 
economic growth of, in our country, in the region, and also for uh, future strategic perspectives in Europe. Uh, but Free Seas, the initiative started about five, six years ago uh, when four countries in the region, the Central and Eastern European region, uh, that uh, are surrounded by three seas. You have the Baltic States and the Baltic Sea, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, the Visegrad Four, Poland, Czechia, uh, Hungary, Slovakia. Then you have the Adriatic Coast, uh, Adriatic Sea, which is Croatia and Slovenia, and the Black Sea, which is Bulgaria and Romania, and also in Central Europe, uh, Austria has joined the initiative. So there's 12 nations that uh, came together, together five, six years ago to discuss opportunities and ways to further cooperation in the region. This is a tremendously um, fascinating region because it is the fastest growing economic region in the world's biggest economic bloc within the European Union. It offers great opportunities to companies and it also offers great um, opportunities to further economic growth in the region. Um, and as the heads of state discussed issues, they focused on uh, a key area in, in the region that needs solving. That is the infrastructure gap. If, um, let's put it this way, 50 years of Soviet domination and communist rule was not great for the infrastructure in the region. Um, it's um, the IMF in 2020 did a study in the wider region uh, that also encompassed uh, the Western Balkans, uh, Eastern Balkans and Ukraine and estimated that uh, the additional, not the current level of investment, but the additional level of investment needed to reach the same infrastructure levels that Western Europe has, the region will need to invest uh, over a trillion dollars uh, over the next 10 years. That is a huge and a colossal amount. And the heads of states and government of the Free Seas Nations realized that this is a problem that needs to be solved. And they focused on three areas, that is transport infrastructure, energy infrastructure, and looking to the future is digital infrastructure. Uh, these are areas that need large-scale cross-border investments in the region. And no nation can do it alone. And that's why the Free Seas Initiative is a tool to further those investments. Um, and to do that the best way, um, let's be honest, we are in a, now live in a world of great power competition again. And we need to play to our strengths as uh, democracies and value-based societies. And uh, what we see is our strength is the private sector, a free private and liberal marketplace. And the gap, as I mentioned, over a trillion dollars is way bigger than any government could do alone. So we need to use the tools of the private sector to invest in the region. That's why in 2019, the initiative set up its own investment fund. This investment fund is politically inspired, yes, but it, it is run by a private company and no country has a say on, in the decisions of the fund. Um, this fund is uh, aiming to invest in cross-border, large-scale infrastructure projects in the region. So directly to solve the problem that was seen widely. And the fund has been uh, functioning now for a few years. Uh, most of the Free Seas Nations have put in uh, money in the fund. I think it's the fund stands close to a billion dollars. Um, and now the next step is to um, include private sector capital in the fund. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is the fact that the fund has already invested into projects in the, the Free Seas area. So the fund is up and running, and it is slowly, obviously, uh, at, in the beginning, starting to invest in projects that um, enhance cooperation, enhance in, in integration within the region, but also with uh, the rest of the European Union. Uh, so I think this is an excellent example of regional cooperation that could lead to very practical outcomes that are beneficial to the state uh, nations involved and also to the European uh, in a wider uh, role. And as we, as mentioned, if there's a time of great power competition in the world, having this fund doing infrastructure projects in the region is a great way to um, cement 
our values quite correctly cement. Um, because as we see it, who, uh, we are at the standing point where we set the stage for the next century. Who controls um, infrastructure, be it energy, be it transport, be, uh, especially hot topic digital infrastructure, that will set the tone for the next century. We need to be sure that these aspects are uh, market driven based on democratic values. And that's why the pre season initiative is so fundamentally important to Estonia. And the fund has proven to be a practical, practical tool to um, a, reach that goal. So I think shortly that is, uh, maybe I'll just mention that there is a, for our European viewers as well, that in the beginning, there was uh, five, six years ago, there was a real th um, a kind of view going around that the free season initiative is some way a counterweight to the European Union. Let me be clear, that is not the case. Uh, European Union fully supports the initiative. Uh, European Union members are always present at our meetings. Uh, commissioners uh, regularly attend the summits. And it's, um, it's um, one of the elements of European integration. It's not any way counter to the goals of the, uh, the European Union. Uh, on the contrary, it is actually one of the tools for the European Union to further greater integration. And that's why it seems that um, most of the European Union members and the European Commission are fully on board with the initiative. So I think that's a short overview of what it is. Great. Well, well thank you, Marco. I'd love to, uh, as our discussion continues, dive into some of the specific uh, infrastructure projects within the three buckets that you mentioned. But perhaps uh, first I can turn uh, to, to Linus to understand what have the impacts of 3Cs been thus far and what do you expect over uh, the coming years. It's it's obviously too early to judge the final impact of 3C since it's in its early stages. Um, but what do you see the impacts um, already having been and what do you expect uh, over the next couple of years? Sure. Thank you for having me, Chris. Uh, it's always great to join the events organized by FPRI and especially on such an important topic. Uh, well, I always remember a, a quote by late Spikner Brzezinski who was saying once uh, that we need an economic NATO. And he was saying that in the context of a transatlantic trade and investment partnership agreement, which was never reached. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be, uh, it, it's not likely that it's going to be reached in the nearest future. Uh, but to some extent, 3Cs initiative is a small, small scale, much narrower uh, project, which goes in the same direction uh, to create a, a Western initiative, uh, which could enable us to see common goals. And not only pragmatic goals of implementing some rational infrastructure projects, but also to be more competitive, because today's world is also a competitive world. And we hear that uh, every day when we speak about the West versus Russia or the West versus China in some instances. So these kind of initiatives are very much needed because if there is a vacuum coming from the West, that vacuum is usually filled by other countries with their own set of values, set of ideas of how political process shall be led. And uh, well, basically we cannot let that happen. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that uh, this initiative really uh, enables us to join forces. And we have a bipartisan support from the United States, which is an exciting thing in itself. The Baltics or Central Europe seems to be a bipartisan issue in many occasions among uh, US politicians, and that's great. We also have, as my colleague has mentioned already, strong support from the EU, which means there are no basic disagreements on how to proceed and how to reach those, those common goals. And in practice, we see that this is a rather new initiative yet, and there are some technical details that must be resolved. There are a lot of discussions about the need to have maybe a secretariat or some sort of a more permanent position of those who would lead uh, this initiative further, but I think these are the details, and, and the practice means that we need to have as much as much synergies as possible with the European Union and with other organizations to have a combined effort to implement some of these projects. And for instance, I can mention one which is uh, partly discussed in the context of, of three C's initiative, but it's also a much broader one uh, that is um, the LNG terminal that we have in 
in Lithuania, in our port city of Klaipeda, but there are many other LNG projects that are of the same importance, uh, which is basically a project uh, which obviously covers energy issues, but not only of Lithuania, of all the Baltic states, if we have the necessary infrastructure to share the gas that comes from various countries, including the United States of America, including Norway and others, and um, lessens our dependence on the only source of gas, that was just recently the case, uh, which is Russia. So by implementing this project and by having uh, support for it coming from different sources, we obviously strengthen our democracies and we also enable new ways of cooperation because uh, U.S. gas coming to Europe is a rather new thing for all of us, but it uh, enables us to see <clears throat> new ways of continuing cooperation, not only focusing, uh, for instance, on security matters, on military mobility and other crucial aspects, but also on this kind of energy cooperation. So it opens new doors and enables us to be to be stronger, which is which is what we are trying to achieve in in our foreign policy and national security policy as well, both nationally and and regionally. And finally, I think we must uh, understand that it's not a charity foundation, as it was mentioned again. It was a, it is an investment foundation, investment fund, which is able to provide us via different ways. So it's it's another great way of showing that you could really combine efforts and and have common goals achieved with various ways of, of having the benefits um, spread around. Thanks. Well, thank you. I, I love the example of LNG and gas infrastructure because it does show how we can have a, a positive impact on integrating Europe and integrating the US in Europe in a way that reduces Russian influence. I think especially in the context of uh, the divisiveness of the Nord Stream 2 project, this is the exact opposite uh, in terms of something that's bringing together Europe and the United States in a in a productive way. I'd be interested, uh, Linus, in you mentioned China, which of course has its Belt and Road Initiative and is uh, making promises to build roads and bridges across the world. Um, how does 3Cs interact with China's efforts to grow its influence uh, in Europe? Well, I think it can play a very prominent role because we usually when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, we say it's the only uh, player in town or basically the only initiative that could be well attractive to a lot of countries that really need to uh, focus on developing their infrastructure or solving some energy issues and we've seen China being very active in some central and eastern European countries in uh, trying to uh, participate in projects such as nuclear power plants and, and etc. So if there are no alternatives to that of course, of course, that could be a problem. And I've heard multiple times, even in country uh, such as Lithuania, which has never been uh, in a position to make a choice between East and West. It's never a discussion for us. It's, it's an obvious choice that we made some time ago and there's, there's no way of coming back. But even here we can speak that, uh, well, you know, the West does not provide enough uh, incentives for us or enough support to develop those very expensive, very long projects. So maybe, you know, some other countries could help us with that, especially maybe some five years ago when China was a relatively new phenomenon for some of us in the Baltics. We haven't been discussing it uh, often from the national, national security point of view. And that for some could have been uh, a way of, of really solving some of these issues. But uh, again, we now understand a much broader set of issues that goes with that. And uh, the 3Cs initiative could fill some of these gaps. And it's probably not a surprise that we've had just recently the G7 meeting, which again discussed on how to be competitive against China basically, openly stating that, uh, because uh, the investment that comes from China obviously has political implications. There is no doubt about it. Marco, you mentioned um, digital infrastructure being one of the, the three baskets of investment. And Estonia has obviously been uh, a leader in Europe and the world in thinking about um, digital infrastructure. What, when you look at the category of digital and three Cs, what are the specific projects that you think um, might be interesting or are there, are there specific types of digital infrastructure that uh, you're focusing on or that you hope that the 3Cs initiative will uh, bring to light? Uh, thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, and luckily I have a, quite a direct answer for it. Um, one, so as I mentioned, uh, the 3Cs investment fund has um, 
uh, finance or invested in two projects. One of them were, was in Estonia in the digital sphere. What the fund invested in was a company that is building um, green energy, so very um, economic, um, uh, environmental friendly data centers. So basically centers of servers um, and uh, that store data, but doing it in an environmentally friendly way. And the fund invested in it, um, first center is being built in Estonia. The aim is to have regional, uh, the company's aim is to expand regionally. So have these types of centers um, throughout uh, the region in essence. And it's a very practical way how you can uh, invest in digital infrastructure because data flows across borders and there is no way to do it purely nationally. I think the, I think maybe what you hinted in your question was uh, the question of 5G infrastructure that it probably will not be the focus of the investment fund. I can't speak for them, but logically seeing uh, that most of the uh, 5G networks will be built by national uh, companies and uh, they, it's just more uh, the data flow is what is um, cross-border and that's where the investment fund can have a, a function. I wanted to comment on uh, the previous question as well, if I may. Um, the, it's important to everyone to understand, I think, that the uh, initiative and the fund are ours, um, so owned by the nations in the region. This is us doing it for us. And the more we can get international um, contributions, the better. But it, it is Central European led, Central and Eastern European led, and uh, with the goal of uh, improving lives for the people in the region. So it's not directly aimed at competing with China. Chinese investment can still be there. Um, it's up to everyone to decide on their own. But um, I think the best way to describe it, it's a little bit of like a marketing tool, the Free Seas Initiative. Estonia is too small, maybe, alone to attract global investments. If you put it together with 12 other nations in the most, in the fastest economic growing zone in the European Union that uh, that has more than 100 million people that is a different market and that is a different um, investment opportunity for companies the private sector so I think that's the way to look at it well I see we've already gotten some uh, questions put in the Q&A function and I'll encourage our audience uh, to add uh, additional questions and we'll, we'll start picking uh, up audience questions in just a couple of minutes but Marco, you also mentioned um, the, the the prospect of green energy, and obviously Europe is in the midst of a, a, a truly massive project to transition its economy away from carbon-based energy towards green energy. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how does the Three Cs initiative and fund interact with uh, Europe's broader energy transition? Thank you. Um, so the fund itself is independent, and so it has um, a sort of guidelines on what to invest in. Uh, I think um, green energy is, is there as a guideline. It's not as prominent as in the European, uh, uh, European Union's uh, official policy, but it's still, uh, as mentioned, uh, the fund will, uh, as mentioned from the example and the investment, the fund will try to support these kind of transitions. And I think going towards green energy is not something that um, we can avoid. The fund will do its due diligence and do its work based on economic interest, in econo economic uh, incentives. And uh, being environmental friendly is one of those incentives. So I think that's, that's uh, the way that the fund will also uh, incorporate that into their decision making. We've got a couple of audience questions in right now, so perhaps I'll turn to some audience questions and, and maybe pepper in a few of my own as we go through the audience questions. But the first question is on uh, Germany and the Three Seas Initiative. We've heard about how uh, the initiative relates to the European Union as a whole, uh, but one audience member asks uh, whether Germany uh, might even uh, join the initiative as a potential member. Uh, and obviously Germany does uh, border the, the Baltic Sea, so perhaps it, it fits geographically. Um, Linus, Marco, would either of you like to comment on that? I, yeah, I can uh, maybe comment on that. Um, Germany 
is a very close partner to the funds. Uh, German, uh, in 2020, when we had the summit, uh, the German president was at the summit. Um, it's, um, they, are, they are a very close partner. We would love them to see uh, more involved. We would love their investment to the in, uh, investment fund, for example. Um, but as far as joining the initiative itself formally, um, I don't think that is something that is actively discussed. Um, it's um, how Germany and the wider European institutions, the EBRD, for example, could uh, contribute to the initiative is actively discussed. Uh, Germany joining the initiative formally is not, um, I think it's not really a question that uh, is asked very um, very strongly because, as I mentioned before, this is an initiative, our led initiative for us, mostly. Linus, could I uh, pose a, a, another variant of that question to you, which is the relationship between the Three Seas Initiative and uh, other countries in Eastern Europe who aren't members, but who, who border some uh, member states. Uh, and in particular, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on Belarus and Ukraine and whether there might be um, some sort of interaction between the projects that the Three Seas Fund undertakes and uh, impacts on, on either Belarus or Ukraine. Well, that's a great question, and we'll probably have to wait and see, because at the moment uh, Lithuania uh, is, is very supportive of, of this, of especially including Ukraine in some of these projects and having it in mind, because you cannot probably imagine at least some of those big infrastructure projects implemented without at least the possibility for Ukraine to participate or to join to some extent. But I think it's a bit too, too early to say whether that's possible in the nearest future or in some time in the future. But certainly I think it's on, it's on the agenda and certain countries, obviously the, the Baltics, will be very supportive of that. But not only Baltics, of course. Actually, well, we have a, uh, a question from uh, Karl Altau, who is, of course, a, a friend of FPRIs and a, fr a friend of the Baltics. Um, about 5G development in the three C's um, regions. And he asks about what are the main 5G considerations uh, in the Baltic region in particular, but perhaps more generally um, a, a, across the three C's countries. Um, Marco, would you, would you like to take that? Um, thank you. And good, good to, uh, I can't see you, Carl, but it's always, always a pleasure to be in contact with you. Um, 5G, as I mentioned, is mostly driven nationally, and it's um, every nation's own um, set of rules that guides how they're developed. So I don't know personally how much the investment fund is discussing this um, and uh, if they're considering it. I don't see into their uh, decision making because that's how it's supposed to be. The investment fund is there, managed by a private company. They do their work and it can't be politically influenced. Um, as for, I can only speak to Estonia's case um, on 5G development and we, the parliament adopted the law last year, I think, about 5G um, technology in the Estonian networks and that has to come from secure, safe sources. So uh, that says where we stand on it, but I can't speak to other nations on this. Lannis, do you have anything to add on that question? Or? Yeah, I think it's uh, more or less the same in Lithuania. The political decision has been made and uh, uh, 5G is deemed to be a, a national security issue. So uh, in that case, we can trust the Western companies to provide the necessary infrastructure, but not necessarily all of the third countries. So in, in this case, I think the position of Lithuania and Estonia is, is basically the same. We have a couple of, of questions about uh, China again, um, one about uh, whether China's Belt and Road impacts the Three Seas Initiative's uh, projects and policies. And we've already had a little bit of discussion on uh, how the Three Seas Fund might interact with um, Chinese investment. Also uh, a question about the relationship between 17 plus one, perhaps 16 plus one, we can, I guess, discuss what the, the right name is right now. Um, and, and, and whether uh, either the Three Seas was inspired by 17 plus one or will have an effect on um, on its uh, on its uh, operations going forward, um, Linus, perhaps I can turn to you for that first. Any any reactions to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, as you know, Lithuania has decided not to be actively participating in this format anymore. So probably, yeah, it's not necessarily seventeen plus one anymore. But uh, probably that basically shows Lithuania's view on 
on the future of investment and on the future of priorities. Uh, so probably the three C's initiative is just one aspect of a much broader issue of investment, of infrastructure development, of um, the balance between national security and the investment, which is usually sensitive. So probably not going directly against, but to some extent uh, providing a basis uh, to say that uh, West or Central and Eastern Europe in, in this case is not uh, standing and waiting. It is, it's actively seeking ways of ensuring that uh, Europe is not lagging behind in any <clears throat> of the mentioned strategic initiatives. And it has ways of doing things on its own, basically with support from its allies. And it's not necessary to risk in some instances uh, cooperating with some third countries. And, and do you get the sense that that uh, view is, is, is roughly shared equally among three C's members? I mean, there's a diversity of countries within the group. Uh, we have two representatives from the Baltics um, here today. But, but Linus, do you, do you sense any um, differences in perspective on that question among the three C's members that are, are worth noting? I would say it's an ongoing discussion. It's a relatively new issue. It has a lot of aspects to it. So I think there is no need to be overly strict and to have uh, an answer to every potential dilemma. And I think uh, 3C's initiative as an evolving initiative will play a role in that as initiative as well. But uh, many of the member states or those countries that are participating in this initiative and many other initiatives as well as in the EU as, as a whole will have to face some of these dilemmas, first of all domestically and then by forming their foreign policy position. So I would probably say it's, it's an ongoing discussion with lots of vari variables. Well, it's interesting to look at the debate over the, the Chinese-funded highway in Montenegro as sort of a, a, a lens into uh, this debate in Central Europe. Um, Marco, do you have anything to add on the, on the question of 17 plus one or Belt and Road? Uh, yes, um, I, I think Linus was right on point with its one element. I, I mentioned the IMF uh, figuring out or estimating that there's a lack of a trillion dollar extra investment. That that's the bar that we need to catch up, not to go past, not to develop, but to catch up with the, the rest of Europe. That is the amount of money that the, um, we can't, it's, it's a huge amount of money. And as I mentioned, the investment fund itself has around a billion dollars at the moment. It's a drop in the ocean. Uh, so I think there is room for, it's not either or, it's not free seas or China, for example. There's room for both. There is um, the need is so great that unless the investment fund suddenly explodes in a thousand times bigger, there is there will be nations that are interested in developing their infrastructure in partnership with other nations, uh, with China. And I think that's it's not what the free seas is directly aimed at. It's it's uh, the free seas is a tool to. Um, solve the infrastructure problem or try to help to solve the infrastructure problem. It's not there to push a lot of actors away because there is room for all our actors. We've had a couple of questions on the specifics of how the fund um, operates. Uh, one question on uh, is organization and uh, leadership and how equitable treatment between the different countries that are members um, is, is guaranteed. Another question about whether there's a sovereign financial backstop uh, from the countries uh, involved. Perhaps, Marco, could I turn to you for a bit more granularity on uh, the operation of the fund itself? Sure. Yes. Um, so the fund has, um, let's put it this way, the countries have put money in the fund and, and invested in the fund. And this is important to understand. It's an investment. We put, Estonia put in 20 million euros. We expect to get more back from the fund, uh, as any investment fund uh, hopes to do. Uh, the members that have put money in the uh, fund have a place or a seat at the supervisory board um, that sets broad term uh, guidelines to the fund. But the fund itself is the daily work is fully de de delegated to a private company, Amber Foundation, um, and they have they have the guideline to make investments 
purely on economic um, in, incentives. So they need to do um, their due diligence in, on every project to figure out what investment is needed, how much is the return, because we expect a return uh, on our investment there. And they're in charge of our money, in essence. And there, there is no uh, the question about equitable um, transfer to uh, investment to the three seas countries. That's not the goal of the fund. If they see a good project somewhere, they will invest in it. And they don't have the guideline of every country needs to be invested in, or you can't invest in a country again if you already invested one once. That's not fully there. It's market driven. We have a question from uh, Karen Shuey of the Estonian American National Council about uh, what role uh, the Baltic American community can play in uh, developing the Three Seas Initiative. And I, I'd also add on top of that a, a broader question about the role of the U.S. government in general. The U.S. government has been supportive, um, but I'd be interested in in both of your thoughts on on what, if anything, additionally uh, the U.S. ought to be doing. And perhaps, Linus, we can start with you. Yeah, sure. I think the fact that the U.S. is participating and we've had, I think, a joint uh, statement in, in the Congress just relatively recently supportive of, of this. We've had uh, the change of administrations and uh, the policies hasn't shifted, which is a big stamp of approval that it's, it's an initiative that the uh, U.S. deems uh, favorably and understands the importance of it. And uh, that, again, is being supported by the EU as well. And it makes it uh, a global project, not necessarily only a regional one, even if it's focused on the region. And obviously, as it was mentioned before, those countries that are directly participating in it are responsible for the success uh, or, or poss possibilities for the future of it. So, so that's, that's very important. And hopefully, the US will be able to indirectly uh, benefit from it as well as contribute to it. For instance, as I mentioned, the gas is, is probably the best example. If we have a, an infrastructure developed, then it's a possibility for American gas or more possibilities for American gas to, to go to those parts of Europe that really need it. And that's an export benefit for the US. That's a benefit of, for, for those countries that get uh, uh, gas from the sources uh, that we deem obviously safe and, uh, and secure. So these kinds of small things that are not necessarily directly results of 3C's initiative, I think are multiple, or at least possibilities for that are multiple. And Linus, you mentioned that the new administration has been um, supportive of the 3C's project. Do you sense uh, any, um, any change in the intensity of that support? President Trump was in, in Warsaw at the time of an early 3C summit, so there was a, a whole lot of support from the administration. Has that intensity of, of support changed at all in your perception? Well, we'll see. It's early stages of, of the new administration, uh, just over 100 days. And uh, of course, there are multiple things on the agenda of President Biden on, uh, and of uh, State Secretary and of others. So I think uh, the fact that we've had this, this statement, we've had this uh, supportive uh, arguments coming from the new administration is, is a lot already. But uh, I think things will evolve as Joe Biden and his team uh, gets going and uh, is able to cover more things. And we will see probably the president coming to Europe quite soon, obviously. Uh, we'll, he'll have a lot of, again, different issues on his agenda, but that, again, goes in the same direction. If he's in NATO summit, if he talks about security issues, we'll certainly talk about infrastructure in one way or another, because one of the biggest issues that we all try to solve in the Baltic states is, is related to infrastructure, just probably maybe two more examples, even though indirectly related to what you asked, Chris, uh, I think we still understand that the Baltics are to some extent cut off from our partners in the West in terms of electricity system, which is still synchronized with Russia rather, with the, uh, rather than with our partners in the West. And you need a lot of investment for that to change. And we have this investment coming from the EU, but possibly the Reese's initiative could play maybe a role in that. If we want to travel by rail from Vilnius to Berlin, you basically basically have to go somehow to Warsaw and then switch uh, to a, a rail that is a, a Western type of rail rather than the Soviet type of rail that we still have in, in our region. And again, to solve this gap, we need investment and the EU is 
probably providing an investment for that. But again, maybe 3C is an issue that could play a role. And there are multiple, multiple similar examples that are also related to military security, because if we have this good infrastructure, then NATO is able to act fast in case something happens, or even in their daily duties of, you know, going to military exercises or etc. So that is again, again, uh, an element that goes in the same direction of of making the Western alliances as a whole stronger. Yeah, that's a great example of, of the ties between the economic, the political, and the military all being interconnected. Um, Marco, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts as well on, on on what the U.S. can do to be supportive. Uh, the U.S. has been extremely supportive, and I think I echo Linus here that both administrations that I've worked with here in Washington, D.C. have been extremely supportive of the initiative. Um, I think the, what the United States brings to the table at the Free Seas uh, Initiative and in the investment fund is trust. If a private company sees that um, the United States government is investing in the fund, for example, that is a huge sign of trust towards the the kind of goals of the fund and that that's what i think is the real beneficial added uh, value of united states participation i think very similarly to germany the united states has is very closely working together with um, the initiative but it, there's no real discussions of the united states being an official member or a formal member of the group uh, it's more uh, their support is a very good unifying actor for the nations uh, involved. And of course, we saw that effect very clearly when uh, Secretary of State Pompeo at the time in January 2020 uh, pledged 300 million to the investment fund. And that really galvanized many nations in, um, in the initiative to also uh, put money in the fund. That, that, that is a driving unifying factor for the region. So. United States supports. We're very uh, welcome. Uh, we're welcoming it very warm-heartedly, and it is tremendously important. How? Um, what? What will the, the practical steps of the new administration to support the fund and the initiative be? Yet, so we have to wait a little bit and see what comes out. But I think the early statements made by. Secretary, Biden, uh, Secretary Clinton and President Biden have been very positive and very um, well noted from our side. At least. We have a, a couple of um, questions related to the pandemic and the uh, economic situation after the pandemic. Um, one about whether the Three Seas Investment Fund will benefit at all from the recent EU uh, post-pandemic stimulus. Um, and then second, uh, more generally about uh, given the economic difficulties the pandemic has caused, uh, what strategies the fund has to, to raise investment uh, uh, given the economic context? Um, Marco, perhaps I could turn that question to you. Uh, yes, um, I think the fund uh, has a big role to play in the future of the region. It's a little bit too small to be a very active role in the economic recovery after the pandemic. It's also not not its goal uh, as such. Um, but um, what? Um, yeah. So I don't think there's a lot. And uh, sorry, somebody's um, washing the windows in my floor um, office, and it's distracting me a little bit. And apologize. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Um, about strategies to uh, attract investment uh, given okay. economic difficulties. Yes, um, the fund has done now the uh, first part, which is get investments from most of the free countries. And that has worked out well. And that was that's kind of the seed money. Now the fund uh, is aiming at attracting investments from private sector. So actually not only um, investing in private sector in partnership with private sector to certain projects, but actually having big funds, global funds, uh, invest into the fund. So the fund is um, uh, around 1 billion US dollar level at the moment. They aim to be 5 billion um, euros in the coming years. So then the second round is the private sector funds in, to invest into the fund. And that's what we are actively doing, uh, or we, uh, the fund is actively doing, and we're supporting the fund's efforts on that. 
And in terms of the, the fundraising strategy that the three C's fund has, it's a commercial oriented uh, uh, prospect for the people it's seeking funds for. The idea is that if you invest in these projects, there will be, in addition to the, the political and social benefits we discussed, an economic return. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, for any private sector fund to put $100 million into the fund, uh, the Free Seas Fund, they need to see a return on investment. Um, and that's, that's how the fund operates. It says that this is a fund that is aimed at infrastructure projects where there is a lack of infrastructure in a region there's, where there's a lack of infrastructure and a region that is economically growing very, very fast compared to um, other areas in the European Union. So that should be a great incentive for the private sector to invest into the fund. We have a couple questions about um, culture and identity. Um, are there efforts underway to, um, to bring together the countries of, of the Three Seas Initiative um, in, in terms of a shared culture? Obviously, all the countries are, are part of the European Union, so there already is uh, EU efforts underway. Um, but but Linus, perhaps uh, you could comment on the on the the, the cultural aspects of, of three C's insofar as you see any. Well, sure. I think the idea of three C's initiative has a very strong geographic and historic aspect to it, and the name of of the project or of the fund uh, clearly states that. Uh, in Termarium, we're talking about common history, shared uh, geopolitics, shared experiences, and that enables us probably to seek ways to combine efforts and to avoid some of the miscalculations of the 20th century or even uh, things uh, from a more distant past. So in that sense, I think there is a cultural and identity aspect, but I wouldn't overemphasize it. I think symbolism always plays a crucial role. It also brings us together to one table and makes us, uh, uh, well, pushes us to understand our uh, concerns better. But on the other hand, I think we have multiple regional initiatives. We have Baltic Nordic initiative, we have the European Union, we have NATO, much broader ones, and they can fill some of the gaps that uh, are not being able to solve by more global initiatives. I mean, those regional ones, smaller ones, they enable us to talk more often, possibly uh, more concretely. But in the end, I think it's only a combination of efforts that could uh, bring us uh, sustainable results. And I think it's fantastic that we have strong EU support for three C's initiative. It's fantastic that we have strong US support for this initiative because uh, three C's on its own will not be able to solve all the infrastructural gaps that we still have. Uh, as it was mentioned, we are talking about $1 billion at the moment. We need much more than that to solve every aspect that we have on our agenda. But together with others, with other uh, policies, with other organizations, uh, at least uh, a path forward is, is clearly visible. Marco, do you have anything to add on, on that front? I, I, no, I think Lina has answered it very well. Well, I've got a couple of questions uh, via the, the chat function as well as one via Q&A on um, specific transportation infrastructure projects that uh, are either underway or, or you see as potentially um, relevant, including questions on, on highways, on, uh, on, on, on river transport, um, and on, um, on, on facilitating the movement of goods and materials, so, so uh, kind of shipping and transportation infrastructure. Um, Marco, perhaps I could, I could turn that question to you in terms of um, what's already underway uh, and what you see as uh, potentially plausible uh, in, the, in the initiative. Um, I think it's a hard question to answer because the field is the field of opportunity is so wide and in the end it's not me or my government that's going to make the decision on what to invest it's going to be amber capital uh, as the fund managers but opportunities one of the other project that the fund has invested in was a railway project in poland that's connecting it through to neighbors so railways definitely i mean uh, waterways done move of a order connection those rivers to connect those rivers for river transport uh, I think a project that is on the way and is vitally important to that region in the, uh, Europe is the Kurk um, LNG terminal in Croatia, for example. Um, countless highways, tunnels, um, contain sea container terminals, and all the digital infrastructure. This, the opportunities are wide, and 
um, the deep. It's more that the fund and Amber Capital have to make the decisions, and it's important that nations don't try to influence those decisions. Well, I, I guess a, a, a key challenge and a key benefit of the Three Cs framework is that m many of the projects, if not most of them, that you discussed as being potentially relevant are international, and so having a, a framework that involves all of the countries is is crucial. That's very that's very important. Um, that's that's crucial. The initiative set its goal to improving cross border infrastructure. That's a that's the key term, and the fund is obligated to. Uh, only fund projects that at least have an effect in three, um, at least three nations of three seas, or at least two nations at the free, in the three seas initiative, and one more nation could be a neighboring country. So that is a requirement that it is a cross border uh, project. Well, I'd be interested in our, our last couple of minutes to get a sense on. Um, on what the next steps are for three C's uh, after the fund. Although I saw we just got one question that came in on how exactly is, is the three C's initiative coordinating cross-border projects. So perhaps I could turn that to Marco as well. Um, what's, what's the mechanism of improving cross-border uh, uh, infrastructure? Uh, yes, um, so I think it, there's two uh, ways that the initiative helps. One is uh, on a political level, the heads of state meet regularly once a year now, the next step is to formalize uh, a more governmental level uh, format. So uh, let's say the ministers of energy or the ministers of finance of the Free Seas Initiative countries would regularly meet and discuss opportunities and challenges and, and uh, find ways to cooperate. Uh, that's, I think, a very important step uh, forward for the Free Seas Initiative. It's also um, including a little bit of wider range of countries. I think Poland is a thriving uh, initiative to um, have a ministerial level meeting with the wider region, including Ukraine, Georgia, and see what the challenges there are there. Uh, as for the, how the fund manages cross-border infrastructure, again, it's the fund has guidelines to invest uh, in projects that affect um, more than two nations in the region. And that's, that's how um, the fund um, implements the, uh, the goal of uh, in improving cross-border infrastructure. It ha we don't say what project the fund will fund. That's not ours. The fund has the goal of affecting at least three countries with every project. And what that project is, be it a highway, be it a railroad, be it a data center, is up to the fund to decide. And presumably the fact that the governments are investors in the fund means that if there are regulatory issues or political issues that need to be resolved, the governments are supportive in that sense. Exactly. And that's why the governmental level meetings are so important uh, to have a discussion on a level. Pre the three, three C summits have usually been heads of, heads of state level, so presidents. Um, they, in our case, for example, have very little uh, regulatory power. Um, there's the government that makes regulations. So that's why the finance minister or the energy ministers or the um, IT ministers having a regular discussion is fundamentally important. Excellent. Well, let's, let's turn to the question then in our, our final couple of minutes of, of the future. We, there's the fund underway, which is in the process of expanding. Um, I'd be interested to get both of your thoughts on, on what are the next steps uh, under the rubric of, of the Three Cs Initiative uh, and, and what perhaps you'd like to see developing over the next uh, five or 10 years. Um, Linus, can we start with you on that question? Sure, I think it's it's a process. It's it's a long-term process and that's good. Lithuania has been uh, a member state uh, since probably full-fledged member since only the start of this this year. So it's important for us to develop it and to seek probably an expansion of the number of projects that 3Cs initiative uh, directly contributes to or uh, 
um, uh, is is a partner in implementing. So uh, choosing those projects and having a, a daily routine of, of work on the governmental level uh, on this issue is, is obviously very important. So this is partly a domestic issue for countries such as Lithuania. You have to w- find a way of, of really being effective in dealing with issues related to three seas initiative domestically and then uh, seek for ways of contributing to the process on the international level as well. But as this project has been here for a while and uh, all, I think, Lithuanian presidents have been actively participating in, in those summit meetings, I think the perspective from our, from my country side are great. And, and Linus, when you put the, the development that you see next to um, uh, other uh, foreign policy initiatives that Lithuania has been supportive of in, in the region, um, and especially looking further east, um, I, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on, on what impact uh, 3Cs might be expected to have or what you'd like it to have over, over the long run. That's very important. I think uh, the one of the main goals of, of Lithuania is always obviously to include Eastern partnership countries, at least some of them in the initiatives that are being implemented on the EU level or on any other kind of platform such as 3Cs initiative. So I think one of the goals would be to try to find a way for probably Ukraine first, but possibly other countries as well to be included and to be seen as as partners who could not only benefit from uh, common ideas, but also contribute to the implementation of of these. Because in the end, I think the security of the region, both in terms of infrastructure, in terms of digital development and all of the things that I've mentioned before are very much related to the security and development of countries beyond the border, so-called border, if we can say so, of the three seas initiative countries. And it certainly does seem like as we talk about uh, integrating countries like Ukraine into Europe, the infrastructure is, is as important as, as the legal agreements that, that we've signed. So I think that's a, that's a great point. Well, well Marco, maybe in our final two minutes, you can give uh, your thoughts on the future development of, of the three seas and perhaps try to wrap up insofar as it's possible, wrap up our, our, our conversation. Uh, I'll try. Um, I've crossed over a few aspects of the future that I think uh, are important, but just to maybe summarize, it's for me the most valuable part of the initiative that it's Central and Eastern European owned and led with partnerships and allies. And it's a private uh, private um, sector, um, dri- uh, not, it's driven, uh, it's kind of um, brought into life by the governments but the private sector is the one that actually does the hard work. And that's key for me, at least, for the success of the initiative. Looking to the future, uh, Bulgaria has done a great job preparing the the SOFIA summit in June, Uh, I think. I hope it was June. And that that will be a step where we can take stock of what has happened in the initiative in the uh, past few years because these have been monumental shifts uh, within the initiative in the past years and then what to the, how to go forward i think the two aspects looking into the future are a more formalized governmental level meeting uh, or more regular um, and also somehow encompassing uh, the wider region how that happens i think the nations and in the initiative has have to discuss um, a question that estonia supports is creating a secretariat of, and basically an uh, office for the Free Seas Initiative, uh, a phone number and a person they uh, an interested party could call. Um, that we supported, uh, the, but there are other views within the nation, uh, nations of the initiative as well. So that's something to discuss in Sofia uh, as well. Uh, but overall, I what I want to see most is more projects being funded by the fund. That is the practical outcome of all our work and that is actually that will improve the lives of the people and i think we will see more projects in the new future well excellent this has been a wide-ranging discussion of uh, the three c's initiative uh, covering i think uh if not all at least most of its important aspects and i hope that one of the key takeaways uh for our our audience members certainly for for me is is the extent to which uh, this this does in fact have wide-ranging impacts across Europe and and more broadly in the extent to which the United States needs to probably pay closer attention uh, than, than it has uh, thus far and, and be more supportive 
uh, even though it has been supported thus far, there's probably more uh, to be done. So I'd like to thank uh, both of our panelists today for uh, helping us to understand this issue. Uh, Marco, uh, Linus, thank you, thank you for joining us. Hope we can continue uh, this conversation uh, in, in future formats. And thank you to all of our uh, audience members uh, for joining us. I'll, I'll just wrap by uh, encouraging everyone in the audience, uh, if you're not currently signed up uh, to FPRI's email list, please uh, go onto our website, fpri.org, and enter your email address, and we'll let you know about uh, future events like this one, uh, hopefully including uh, both of our panelists today for ongoing discussions uh, of, of this and many other issues. So, uh, Linus Marco, thank you, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity.